Thank you all, and thank you very much for inviting me here. First of all, of course, I would like to congratulate the University of Lund for its birthday. 350 years is, you know, quite old, but also quite young as compared to other universities. Um, Lisa mentioned that my home university is the University of Amsterdam, which was certainly true until January of this year, because I moved back to my alma mater, which is Utrecht University, which I think is a little bit older than Lund, but I won't pitch a fight here, so. Anyway, um, there's a couple of things I would like to discuss with you today. And after this morning's lecture and wonderful talks we heard, um, I would like to talk a little bit more about the platform society. Um, I will base this talk on the book that I wrote with my two co-authors, Thomas Poel and Martijn de Waal. And it was published in Dutch just recently in December. Um, you can actually download it. It's, uh, you know, downloadable from Amsterdam University Press, but it's in Dutch, so I think that language may prevent you from downloading this book. So don't worry, I'm actually currently working with my two co-authors on an English version. It will be a very different version because it will be, uh, I will be dealing with more like an English-speaking part of the world, so not just with, uh, with uh, the Netherlands. And we're currently writing the last chapter. So in order to get that last chapter written, I would love to hear some contributions from you. So by the end of my talk, I will basically tell you what my ideas are for the last chapter. And then I hope you'll co-author it with me and I will uh, recommend you in, the last, you know, in my uh, preface. So what is, this, uh, uh, what is this platform society about? And if I had to summarize my talk in just 140 words, 140 tokens is just not enough to you know, explain this all, but I would basically say it's a global ecosystem of online platforms driven by a set of platform mechanisms it is penetrating every sector of society while bypassing local and national institutions that traditionally anchor public values. And just in case you can't remember this, I will take this summary as, a key, as cues throughout my lecture. So don't worry, it will all come back. So this is, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the shortest summary. But these are the questions that I will be asking over the next 40 minutes or so. Who is responsible for a fair, democratic, and responsible platform society? Who is responsible for that? And secondly, how can public values be negotiated in such a platform society? So those are the questions that we, I will be entertaining you with for uh, the next uh, 40 minutes. Let's start with the first line, a global ecosystem of online platforms. Now, that may not be, you know, a common thing, you know, that you hear, a platform, e a global ecosystem of online platforms. Um, there will be a few terms, you know, that you will hear frequently used. Oh, let me first stick to this one. But there's a few terms that you um, will hear regularly, and one of them is the sharing economy or the platform e uh, economy, or even the platform revolution. Well. In my view, I would really prefer the term platform society for several reasons. First, I think the platform society is not just about sharing. I think sharing is a terrible misnomer. I've explained it in my previous book, The Culture of Connectivity, and I dedicate a full chapter in that book to uh, why sharing is a misnomer for uh, these kind of economic activities online. But it's also not just about economic developments. It is actually, you know, it involves a lot of things. It involves social, political, and cultural transformations. And the platform society, for one thing, has built on a global corporate ecosystem, which is penetrating all kinds of offline institutions that are most, mostly organized nationally. They're affecting geopolitics. So, for that reason, I use the term platform society, but in fact, what I need to use is the plural of platform societies, of platform society, which is societies. I rather prefer that term because, of course, there is no one platform society in the world. Um, what is true, though, is that there is an American platform ecosystem that is dominant, but it's not unique in the world. China, for one thing, has operated, is operating its own, its very own ecosystem, and that is operated by its own big five. I will return to the American ecosystem shortly, but this is just a little sideway to let you know that 
platform, there's not just one system, a platform ecosystem operating in the world. There is a Chinese uh, ecosystem. And it's operating by its own five own big companies, which is... Uh, in, which includes Alibaba, Tencent, Tencent is the owner of WeChat, for instance, Baidu and Jingdong Mail. So those five companies really, you know, are sort of uh, capitalizing on the Chinese system. The Chinese ecosystem is a form of state capitalism. Their corporations are more or less ruled by the state, whereas in the uh, American-based ecosystem, it's the other way around. Now, what is interesting, though, and this you know, I'm sort of, I'm writing this book, but this will probably be my next book, I'm already thinking about it. Um, that Chinese ecosystem deploys, I think, the very same mechanisms as the American system, the American-based system does, only driven by another ideology, which is more of a state ideology. This is my dream for a future book, so we can discuss that later, but now it's sort of, a, I, I will sort of sidetrack it. Uh, because I will talk more about those mechanisms later. It deploys the same mechanism, but it's only driven by a different ideology. Now, the American uh, ecosystem of platforms certainly op operates globally. And indeed, it did fail to penetrate the Chinese system. Google, Facebook, uh, Uber, they're all trying very hard to get an entrance into that America, uh, into the Chinese ecosystem of platforms. But so far, all of them have been left out of that system. They're kept at bay by the Chinese government because they don't want to, to interfere with that Chinese ecosystem of platforms. Very interesting geopolitical uh, adventure that you may be talking about more tomorrow, I heard. But this is just an interesting idea that I will entertain for a next book. Um, let's go back. Let's go back to that American-based ecosystem. And what we're talking about, if we concentrate on that American-based platform ecosystem, it's driven by what I call the Big Five. Um, I think there was an American in the New York Times, an American uh, columnist mentioned uh, the frightful five, which I think it's going too far. But uh, I don't. I want to steal that term from him. But I call it the Big Five. Of course, it's Google, which is now called Alphabet, or the uh, its parent company is Alphabet, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon. They're, they are by far the five big platform owners. And through those Big Five. All of the platforms that we know and that we care about and that we have on our phones, they're all connected. And they're, connecting, they're connected basically into a worldwide system that uh, runs on you know, a few principles, the principle of scaling and the principle of network effects. Those networks, uh, network effects and scaling turn them into huge platforms. You know, that is how they work. That's how they operate and that's how they become big. By gaining lots and lots of users. Facebook is now boasting 1.9 billion uh, users in the world. And those platforms, they're increasingly, they increasingly act as gatekeepers of all of our social and economic activities. Everything you do every day is mediated, is uh, connected through these platforms that are also gatekeepers to, to your daily social life. Not only that, but they also penetrate each different sector, all the kinds of all social sectors, all the sectors in our uh, society that now work through platforms. Sometimes, you know, through big data and algorithm hubs. Sometimes these platforms decide, they are decided through ownership relations because they buy up like different platforms. And sometimes they just work with partners, also government partners. There's a lot of government partner, partners that, that work with Google and through Google. So through all these different alliances, ownership alliances, but also relations or partnerships, all these, oper they, these platforms manage to to function as gatekeepers to our daily systems. Over the past few years, you've probably all heard about you know, the different uh, uh, startups that were uh, gobbled up by either by Google or by Facebook. Microsoft has just uh, you know, last summer uh, bought up uh, LinkedIn, for instance. I just heard that Minecraft was bought up by Microsoft, one of the big successful uh, um, uh, Swedish um, uh, games. So 
a lot of this market concentration goes into this big five. Now, these big five companies are, you know, at least for the near future, they're sort of forming a, not a monopoly, but an oligopoly, oligopoly, I don't know how you pronounce that, but it's like, you know, the, the five companies that define how uh, the world is going to look like in terms of that platform architecture. Now, that architecture I would like to concentrate on because if the platform ecosystem, which I'm going to explain shortly, if that were a pizza, then I think the pizza crust would be made in the USA and exported to the world. Now, I think it was uh, Stefan yesterday, or Stefan here, you were, you were talking about metaphors, right? I think this is another one of these metaphors that defines how we're dealing with new systems. So the pizza crust would be made in the USA and exported to the rest of the world. Now, that's not just a crust. You know, a crust has a taste. It has something in the architecture that's very defining for the taste of your pizza. So the neoliberal American value system, which is, of course, as we see that from a European perspective, it's privileging corporate interests and favoring a small public sector, to which I will come back later. That ideology, that uh, value system is baked into, very literally, the architecture of the platform ecosystem. So, this is the crust. Then, what about the toppings? On top of that pizza, and I think, you know, we could use all kinds of, of terms to identify what those toppings were, but those toppings can be added from everywhere. They can ad be added by companies, they can be added by, you know, public uh, uh, um, organizations, they can be uh, put on top of that crust by nonprofits, by governments, by American, by Europeans, etc. So the toppings is what we pile, what we pile up on uh, uh, the pizza crust. Nevertheless, the taste of the crust is very defining. Uh, you know, the taste of our pizza. So in order to work with the different toppings, we have to look at the crust and how it defines us, right? So that is my metaphor. Now, let's go back to that system, a global ecosystem of online platforms. And let's concentrate on the second line, the second chapter of that uh, summary. It's penetrating every sector of society. And I literally mean every sector, not just um, commercial sectors, not just private sectors, but also government sectors, non-public and non-profit sectors. So I will give you several examples. And the four examples that I mentioned are actually worked out in the book, in the four chapters. So um, I won't get into, go into much detail into each of these sectors, but that's really where uh, I think much of the work is being done. Let's first on the urban transport uh, sector. It is, of course, a private sector, urban transport, and it's very much um, defined right now by how you know, new digital platforms are penetrating these um, uh, businesses and how they, you, know, you showed IKEA being a turned upside down. I think the transport sector is one of these sectors that is completely turned upside down by a platform like Uber. But it's not just Uber, and I wanted to go away, you know, get away from the myth that it's just one platform that can upset an entire entire sector. So Uber, actually the platform Uber is uh, partially financed by Google, which is what you're seeing in the arrow. Um, and it's right now disrupting a lot of local transportation markets, not just here in Sweden, I suppose, but also in the rest of Europe, in Spain, in, uh, in the Netherlands, and of course in the United States. Um, but Uber is not the only platform that is currently revising the, uh, uh, the transportation business. Other platforms are definitely, they're not just competitors, they're, al they're also trying to upset or disrupt that transport sector from various different perspectives. For instance, you have BlaBlaCar, which is a Spanish company, Spanish-based, but it's now you know, uh, uh, spreading globally. Uh, but you also have like Snap Snapcar, you have Parkfly Rent, WeGo, and many, many other platforms. The biggest uh, competitor of Uber, by the way, is Lyft. Um, they're affecting the complete, the entire transportation sector, not just car, 
uh, uh, you know, car, cars driving or even self-driving cars, which come into the equation if you look at Google and Uber, for instance, which are very much in the development of self-driving cars. But also, on the other hand, public transport. transport. For instance, take a platform like Parkfly Rent, which is currently reimagining or re, uh, reshaping the transportation uh, circle from all the way you from you going uh, you know departing from your home to for instance an airport and what do you do in between that may include parts of public trans transportation but also you know uh, renting a car or calling an uber uh, uh, taxi so there's a lot of things going on in this sector. I won't concentrate on the transport sector today, but I will return a little, you know, to Uber later on in my uh, presentation. Another sector, another sector that I would like to uh, get a glimpse, you know, show you a glimpse of is news. News, of course, is a private sector, at least in the United States, in most of the European countries, at least in my countries, but we still have a large public uh, uh, media sector, at least in the Netherlands, with a large public responsibility. So I think this is an interesting sector because it's mostly, you know, privately driven, corporately driven, but it has a huge public responsibility. Now, in this um, uh, slide, you see two hubs, and those are, I think, the most important defining uh, platform, parts of a platform architecture that we have right now, which is Facebook Newsfeed and Google News. And they're news aggregators. They're not content producers, of course, but they aggregate news from uh, you know, all kinds of content producers. Um, some of these platforms that you see here are digitally born. They're digitally born in the US, for instance, the Huffington Post, Upworthy, BuzzFeed, Gawker, and there's a number of others. Um, and I've, I'm showing you one particularly interesting Dutch uh, digital content producer, which is called The Correspondent. It's an interesting initiative. It's now currently only operated in Dutch. Uh, it's very principled. Um, it doesn't show advertisement. It tries to reinvent the uh, distribution model, and it tries to reinvent the uh, subscribe subscription model. So um, I thought it would be interesting to show this, particularly because as of this week, they're going international. So they're going to sort of, you know, penetrate the English market, which is would be a, a big surprise to me. But it's, I think it's a very encouraging initiative. There's also in this uh, slide a few legacy news organizations turned digital, of course. Of course, New York Times is still a big operation. And Interestingly, it is increasingly integrated in this platform ecosystem. And for one thing, and we will discuss that later, it's increasingly, the, even the New York Times, they have started to buy into the platform ecosystem several years ago. And they're now realizing that they're becoming increasingly dependent, dependent on Facebook and Google News for their ads and for the distribution of their articles. So, you know, over the past few years, I think there has been a lot of turmoil in this new sector that really des uh, deserves our attention. So that's another sector that we looked into into detail. Health, incredibly important um, uh, sector. How many of in this? How many of you are using health or fitness apps? Um, okay, so it's almost half. So you're using RunKeeper or Fitbit or, uh, you know, whatever. I see some people nodding. Okay, so those are health and fitness apps, I think, are currently one of the most, you know, uh, booming uh, sectors in the platform society. Uh, actually, last year, in 2015, there were 165,000 new apps in the App Store, in the Google and the Apple App Store. And it's incredible how, you know, how many of those there are. Interestingly enough, and you see, you know, those little uh, squares in between there, all of the big five companies have created specific, what I would call health hubs. They're sort of gatekeepers for health data. There's Google Fit, there's Apple Health, there's MS, Microsoft Health Vault, and there's a number of others that I didn't, didn't mention. Um, and those, of course, are part of the platform ecosystem of the gatekeeping system, besides the more generic hubs, which is Facebook messengers, Amazon web servers. Most of the health data, by the way, are, served, are, are uh, saved on uh, Amazon servers and distributed through these hubs. Now, 
it's not just those companies, but there's also you know, quite a number of uh, medical data firms that have come to, you know, into the equation as of, I think, a couple of years ago. There's research labs now, particularly in the medical industry, that are increasingly dependent on the big five for their health data. There's even companies that are completely turning into uh, digital health data uh, companies. For instance, in my country, you just mentioned um, uh, 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 Volvo here, which is turning into a different company. Philips, any of you who know Philips, which used to be an electronics company, they have just sold off their last part of electronics, and now they're into, they're calling themselves a tech company and a data company, mostly in health. So they're a health data company, which is interesting. Only several years ago, no one would have ever, ever expected the biggest Dutch firm, 40,000 uh, employees in Eindhoven alone, which is huge. Uh, it's now a data, a health data company. Um, I've written on the health sector extensively in an article in Big Data and Society, so I won't dwell on it much here, but it's there for you to read if you're interested. Health sector is incredibly interesting, and I could talk for hours and hours just on that sector. I won't. I will go to the next sector, which is also incredibly interesting as a sector, um, which is education. Um, Higher education, well, all education in Sweden, and so it is in the Netherlands, is a public sector. And I thought it was very important to also talk about the platform society and how it affects the public sector, which is in most of the, Euro the European countries' uh, education, not entirely so in America. Um, I took for one of the uh, studies, I took MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, as an example of how platforms are penetrating the educational market, the educational sector. Uh, I looked at, for instance, Coursera, Udacity and Edix, and you can read that uh, research in the International Journal of Communication. Now, those big five companies have a huge interest in education platforms. And of course, as any of you can imagine, there is a huge interest, big opportunities for these companies to get obtain uh, data from young people because they will be and they will become lifelong consumers. So from a commercial perspective, it's incredibly interesting to catch young people in an educational system while they're still getting used to, you know, using many platforms. Now, Google particularly is a big player in education. Uh, I don't know if you know the hub, uh, Google Apps for Education, GAFI for short. Google Apps for Education is like, they're, they're like uh, putting several hubs into you know, any of the platforms that are used through, and of course they're distributing also their own hardware, their own uh, very inexpensive laptop computers through Google, which, on which they're already pre-installed. So Google Apps for Education is becoming a huge market. I think Per was talking about that earlier, where software and developing software is built into uh, hardware. Um, it's not just higher ads. Oh, by the way, Google also has owns all the the very favorable, uh, very uh, my favorite hubs at least is our Google Scholar, Google Library, Google Books, Gmail for students. There's all these hubs that we are used for uh, uh, generating data. Um, this chapter or this slide is mostly about higher education, but. In fact, the, mo the big five are interested in all of education, whereas Google has invested, I think, mostly in higher education. Facebook, for one thing, has just several years ago, just, I think, two years ago, started to invest in uh, alt school, which is a new type of primary education where every type of education is conducted online. So from a very young age, children in preschool already starting with Facebook um, uh, software that they keep using in school and where the generation of data adds very much to their personal profile. So by the end of their school career, they no longer, that's the joke at least, they no longer have to write a CV or apply for a university. The university only has to look at their uh, profile and they will see perfectly, you know, how a child has behaved from preschool through high school. And that is, of course, what data allows you to do. Now, education, transport, uh, health, and all the other sectors, of course, are part of what I call platformization. 
And platformization is ubiquitous in all sectors, not just the sectors that I showed to you, but also in finance, in retail, the hotel sector, neighborhoods. Um, you see here neighborhood apps. It's another one of my, uh, uh, my interests. How do neighborhood apps actually penetrate complete neighborhoods and gather data from you and me and everyone else who is giving them away? And then, of course, all of these apps, all of these sectors are built on top of that global corporate ecosystem, the pizza crust, opera operated by the big five pizza bakers. It has, in fact, enormous uh, impact on the organization of our society, the way we live, whatever we do. You know, it has incredible impact on who we are and how we organize our daily life. Now, usually we ask the questions, you know, when you, when you download a new app, what do we do with platforms? But my favorite question actually is, what are platforms doing to us? How do they govern us? And that is mainly my question, uh, you know, my academic question. Just remember that platforms are never ever uh, neutral. They always shape society. And um, my good colleague and dear friend Tarleton Gillespie has explained that, you know, by governance by platforms. Governance by platforms mean platforms are governing us. Whereas we usually talk about, you know, and platforms always complain about that they're being governed by regulators and governments. But how? do they govern us? I think that's, you know, the most important question. And that brings me to the third uh, uh, part of my uh, talk, which is how? That question, I think, is crucial. It's driven by that platform architecture, is driven by a set of platform mechanisms. And um, Stefan already talked about a few of those mechanisms, so he uh, uh, cut some of the grass uh, way before my feet. That's a Dutch expression, so that's another one of the metaphors you can use. But how do platforms govern society? And I would like to identify three mechanisms, and you mentioned already mentioned two of them. The first being datafication, then commodification, and then finally selection. You had another one, but let me explain what I mean and why I think it's so important to use any one of those. Um, the mechanisms in those pizza crusts, they really define how the topics taste. So let's start with datafication, and I will go to them very quickly because uh, Stefan already explained them. Datafication is transforming online activity into data to generate value. Now, user data are a new type of currency. You already mentioned that. Next to money and next to attention, it is really data that we're using as a currency to pay for all kinds of services that seem that appear to be free. Now, each single act by each user is in fact algorithmically, automatically selected and processed, and that is adding to your user profile. So really how, you know, and that's uh, part of the next step is, Every act that is translated into data becomes a data point, and it's those data points that become commodifiable. So commodification is really the creation of online value out of those data flow. The, now, this, of course, I think you already talked about that a little bit, uh, Per, is that we have a few basic business models. I won't go through all of them, but they're really, really complicated, and they're becoming more complicated each day. They're really, what you're seeing in terms of commodification is that you have to engage with multi-sided markets where data are traded between platform owners, between platform owners and advertisers, headhunters, data brokers, insurance agents, hospitals, you name it, you know, they become multi-sided markets. And that makes those business models so complicated. So, like the datafication, the commodification part is characterized by its intransparency. It's totally opaque what happens inside, under the hood, you know, in uh, the engine of that car. And also, that particularly holds for, uh, for this mechanism, which is selection. Selection is the algorithmic filtering of uh, user signals. And um, filtering happens through like automated buttons, like you all know the like button, the share button, the friend, the retweets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Hardly any one of us knows which algorithms underlie which activities, and that's how 
they want it to be. I mean, algorithms are totally in transparency. The same holds for personalization. You know, we know that Facebook personalizes the news that we get through our personal news feed, but it's totally incomprehensible how they do that. They do not account for that. There's no accountability. There's no opening up the process. So the same holds for reputation me mechanisms. Uber makes use of, you know, uh, uh, reputation mechanisms. We know that they are there. We know, you know, we, we actually help them, help create them, but we don't know what, what they mean. We don't know, you know, for instance, if an Uber driver gets a four and a half, if he gets less, he will be, you know, we'll never get another job. So what judgments are actually built into those reputation mechanisms? That I think is the big question. So coming back to that entire ecosystem and Actually, you know, the most important part of the book, I think, will be on these mechanisms. How do they work? But the most important thing is that it is impossible to know how their effects steer society. And that is exactly what we need to know more about. This is where responsibility starts, with getting insight into how this system works. Now... Let's go to the next uh, level, which is, this is almost like a game where you, you, know, you get pushed to the next level. But what platform, platforms do is they often bypass institutions, and that is very often called disruptive innovation. Disruption also means in favor of deregulation. Interestingly, in Dutch, the term for, in, uh, for the, uh, disruption is also deregulation. It's the same term. So... And that happens to both private sectors and public sectors. So how does that happen? How do, uh, how do platform companies actually position themselves outside of our current and regular uh, uh, control systems? Uber, for instance. Uber says, well, you know, we're a digital service. We're connecting. The only thing we do is connecting drivers to users, our customers. So as facilitators of that uh, connected uh, connectivity, we're not subject to transport regulation. So this actually is now uh, being handled in the Span uh, the Spanish court was uh, uh, giving this over to the European court, which is now presented uh, with the ruling whether transportation service is whether Uber is a transportation service or a digital platform. A very important definition for uh, European law. If Uber is not a taxi company, its drivers cannot be employees. That's like the logical consequence. So a lot of Uber protests are about the nature of that company. You know, the protests come from both drivers and competitors of Uber. Local taxi companies, for instance, who are arguing that this, this is not a level playing field. After all, Uber, uh, for Uber, if you take an Uber taxi, they charge you a very high fee, which is almost up to 20%, but Uber pays no taxes. They don't pay pensions or insurance fees for their drivers, which is what regular uh, taxi companies are supposed to do. They carry no liability. So yes, Uber generates economic value, for sure, but no, Uber withdraws from public value creation in societies in which it operates, right? So that's the double bind that you're in. Same holds for Airbnb Amsterdam. I was just part of uh, an interesting negotiation with Airbnb in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is one of the big hubs of Airbnb in Europe. Um, they rent out just the city center, 22,000 Airbnb accommodations per year, catering, you know, something like uh, 1.5 million transactions through Airbnb per year. It's huge, huge markets. But there's a lot of protests coming from neighbors. They're very angry at the commercialization of homes and the city. So Airbnb argues, well, we're not a hotel business, we are a connecting service. So Airbnb pays no taxes in Amsterdam. They've just started to charge tourist tax to Airbnb customers, you know, the, the guests that they accommodate. So the city council asked, well, who is paying for security? Who's paying for social order? Who's paying for the collective costs of running a city? In other words, who is responsible for the platform society for running it? And in the long term, they even had, you know, a bigger point because 
Airbnb is really um, uh, sort of messing up the housing, the, the local housing arrangements where you have uh, social housing for people with lower incomes. And because of the rising costs of accommodation in the downtown area, the price of housing, of course, skyrocketed in the past two years. And now there's a huge difference between the half and the half knots in the city center, very small area of a, a few kilometers. Finally, Facebook. In November 2016, just last year after the US election, Mark Zuckerberg said, you know, after he were get, was getting a lot of flack from a lot of people about their sort of mishandling of the, uh, the fake news issue and, you know, a lot of other things, he said, well, we're not a media company. We're not responsible for whatever, filter bubbles, fake news. We simply connect news to content users. We're creating value out of advertising. So that's what we do. That's, that's, in that business, is, that's what we are. So, in other words, Facebook does not accept responsibility of a news organization for curating and editing content. But, of course, it has incredible influence on the visibility of news. So here's the pizza paradox, perhaps this is called. In 2015, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles, Facebook owns no content, and Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. And indeed, per, they're worth many, much more than you know, the ordinary companies. Airbnb, for instance, it's valued in the stock market now 50, uh, 50 billion, whereas, uh, for instance, the Hyatt hotels are only worth 10 billion dollars. They have like all this real estate, right? So it's almost incomprehensible as to where that value comes from, which is another question. But let's get to the last uh, 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 to my last note. What about public values that were traditionally anchored in public institutions and in institutions that we need for regulation? So what about that public value? How is it anchored? How do we get to it? Now, here I put up some of these public values that I think are very important for, to our democracies. And on the left side you see, I think, important values that are directly linked to platforms. We worry about their accuracy. You know, when we use health apps, of course we're worried, worried about their accuracy, and rightly so. We're worried about security, about privacy, very important. But then on the other hand, on the right hand, you're seeing some long-term, more general public values, such as transparency, as fairness, democracy, that I think are becoming very nebulous now. How are they anchored in this platform society? What do we as you know, public organizations do to actually uh, uh, handle them with care? And they were traditionally anchored in institutions, but they're increasingly steered by those invisible, very intransparent uh, uh, platform mechanisms. So, Here's my last question, my basic question. Who is responsible for a fair, democratic, responsible platform society? And how can these values be negotiated? And I will you know, walk you through a few of these things. Here's just, this is just a, uh, you know, an ideal model of the platform society. A platform society, I think, is not a thing, something that is finished. To me, it is a... Every day, it's an ideological site of contestation. This is where, uh, you know, where we contest where public, what public values are, what they do, and how they steer our societies. The actors that you're seeing in this, uh, in this figure, they come from market, from state, and from civil society. And all of those are part of that negotiation, as it should be. I don't think it always is, but I think where negotiations are taking place is in the middle of that square. Market forces, civil uh, organizations, and of course, states. Whereas indeed, for me, state is not necessarily a negative thing. I, we may come back to that in the discussion. Um, so platforms themselves are actually very eager to um, most of the commercial platforms to only have market actors involved in that negotiation negotiation process. So what can we do to sort of break into those negotiations? And I'll give you three examples. That's my last thing. Example one, exhibit one, I need to say. Negotiation between the City Council of Amsterdam and Airbnb about fairness. What is fair in a city like Amsterdam? You know, in terms of sh housing, of sharing your accommodation with others. Of course, there's 
you know, there were these negotiations in December, which I thought was very interesting. The city council uh, told, you know, told the public like, oh, we've got a big win in December. So what was the win? They actually have a limit for Airbnb uh, limiting the number of days that people that guests can stay in one accommodation to 60 days. So Airbnb, the big win in that uh, negotiation was that Airbnb was going to build that into its interface so that the city need not uh, to, uh, uh, to send out 100, or 100 plus um, uh, law enforcers to actually control all those ac accommodations. So it was built into the, the interface. So that was the biggest you know, win in that negotiation part. Um, I think the city that you know, made less of a big win than they uh, advertised, but I think there's still a lot of things that they need to negotiate with Airbnb, and not just Airbnb. There's a number of other platforms that they need to negotiate that with. But Airbnb, for instance, refused to give the city access to its database. So, of course, they invoked privacy as their main argument, but what really happens is that the city cannot actually check their compliance. So what the heck, you know, why do we have rules if you can't even check their compliance? But this is, uh, you know, just another part of that negotiation. I also think that the city could have done better in terms of sort of limiting that number of days that people can stay in the downtown area to 15 days, but then outside of the, you know, the city, uh, the, urba, the, the suburbs and the, especially the poorer parts of the city, they might as well have uh, limited there to 90 or even, uh, as far as I'm concerned, to 180 days so people can make money in those areas and like the downtown area. By the way, New York, New Orleans have uh, totally different negotiations with Airbnb, which is interesting. I compare those. In New York, there's a minimum, a 30 days minimum to, uh, that was imposed by the city. And in New Orleans, uh, the Airbnb is not allowed to rent out accommodation in the French Quarter, which I also think would be a good idea for Amsterdam. But I'm not on the city council of Amsterdam. So, example two. Um, this, I think, is a very interesting case. It's not in Europe, it's in uh, South America, and it's in Sao Paulo. Uber in Sao Paulo um, was uh, faced with, you know, the city negotiations about their regulation, and they had to work with a couple of problems in the city of Sao Paulo, which was one, there was too much tra traffic in the downtown area for all these taxis. There were too many taxis in the first place. There was unemployment, a lot of unemployment, especially amongst women, and poor accessibility of some city areas. So the city of Sao Paulo said, we have all these problems, we will regulate, we will use this platform negotiation to also solve those urban problems. So what they did is they, designed, and this was technology by design, they designed a transport uh, system with credits. Uh, they had a licensing, they issued a licensing system based on credits per transportation miles. Interesting thought, but those credits can be priced dynamically. So, for instance, um, your mileage would be cheaper if you were going to underserved areas, so you can buy into that system. So what the city of Sao Paulo basically does is work with that system to not create problems, but to solve the problem that the city already has and base their regulation system uh, on those credits. For instance, um, a minimum of 15% of all credits would go to unemployed female drivers, so they would get employment. So you can be, actually be very creative with, uh, with a system or with negotiations. Example three, I won't go much into detail because of lack of time, but this is an interesting alternative, which is a co-op. It's Lazuz, it's called Lazuz, it's a, co a platform cooperative where citizens sh uh, share rights and they have invented their own currency credit system. So it's another type of technological invention that was very much embedded in a social cooperative where they were using it as a sort of um, uh, uh, system. And in this system, there's no sharing with other big platforms. So, an interesting example, but I won't go into detail. One more example before I finish. Who is responsible for flagging fake news? And fake news was a big issue. I, and I just mentioned that Facebook did not want to be responsible for fake content. You know, they, some say, well, those who produce fake, fake content are responsible for it. Others say, well, you know, it's not 
producers, it's Twitter, Facebook, and Google who are responsible for distributions. And others, yet others say, well, it's opaque selection mechanism that, is, that are responsible for, uh, uh, for these uh, fake ads, uh, sorry, for fake news. Now, Facebook, which I just called an irresponsible company for not handling fake news, actually realized that something needed to be done because for the simple, very commercial reason that it was losing advertisers. You know, many advertisers are now realizing that their, be their content is being put next to uh, fake news or hate speech or whatever content they do not like. And sort of, you know, it pollutes the news feeds. So what Facebook did is they took two types of actions. First, they asked users to flag fake news or spam. And second, they asked news organizations to flag fake news. Now, this is very funny. Well, it's not so funny when you start thinking about it, but Facebook indeed wants to outsource their responsibility as a news company, but of course, they're not a news company. They want to outsource that responsibility to users and to content producers. Now, over the past few weeks, I've seen several very interesting responses from news producers, very legitimate and, you know, uh, 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 producers of news content like the New York Times and also in my own country, in the Netherlands. There were two newspapers who put uh, a short article and a comment on the front page saying they were, were refusing to act as Facebook wanted them to do, right? For the first time, they were just mad at Facebook. They said, well, we've given you everything, we're giving you our content, you're distributing that, and now we're not going to act as your editors. And also a lot of users sort of, you know, protested this uh, question from Facebook, do you want to flag our content? So, in fact, I think this is the beginning of what we should, you know, realize is that users, content producers, all of us legitimate actors in that, you know, whole uh, uh, negotiation arena, we should become much more assertive, much more, you know, aware of what we're doing in that negotia negotiation contest. So, in short, to conclude, I think that each of the sectors that I talked about is a separate field of struggle of negotiation. So, all of the actors have a stake in shaping that global platform society, and a legitimate stake at that. I think also that governments, which I haven't talked much about due to a lack of time, but they have a special responsibility to organize that platform society and to show uh, uh, governmental uh, um, uh, responsibility. So my main question remains, and this is where I need your input, especially for the last chapter, right? I hope to, I can give the answer in the last chapter. What does it take to shape fair and democratic platform society? How do we do that? On top of, once again, an ecosystem, the crust, which is very much, which architecture is very much shaped by those American neoliberal values. In fact, asking that question is asking how to square a circle. And I think that platform society is still under construction. Building trust, and there I totally agree with Per, I think we're on the same page there. Building trust in that platform society really very much depends on all actors, you and me and I and my government and, you know, all the companies that are involved in creating platforms and also in distributing them, generating data, and distributing them, we're all part of that negotiation. So. I really recommend you for having this conference where I think you have invited people from all kinds of disciplines, and I think that is crucial to involve people from all different areas, not just technology, not just law, not just economics, but from all over society where we can all act as responsible actors in that platform society, plural, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose. This is very interesting. Um, now, you brought up a couple of practical examples on how communities have dealt with one issue, which is uh, the platforms sort of disrupting what used to be a chain between you pay for something, a service or a good, and then money goes into also the tax system so that we have money for our common goods, for our right. society. And that is broken, that chain, and how that could be dealt with in different ways. But 
I'd like to go back to the pizza again mm. and ask, do you have any examples of any community or society trying to battle this, the value problem that we are maybe, that maybe values, a value system is forced upon us because it comes with the pizza crust. <laughs> we can only provide yeah. the toppings because that's a more abstract and maybe well, more difficult situation. I would say that's the million dollar question. Um, because, of course, any type of topping that you put onto the pizza crust is still dependent on that crust. So what I think that we need to do is... I'm also testing this metaphor in you guys because I'm not sure whether it works. I've only uh, made it up recently. We'll have to make so an exit poll. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, do I'll we do like the pizza? <laughs> do you like the pizza? But it is very difficult to actually uh, influence that crust. Now, I think once we see, and that's the, the power of metaphors, in fact, is once we see that we can hardly do without that crust, that without crust there's really no pizza, we can start thinking about alternatives. And we can also think about something else, which is that we can, uh, and that is, I think, what is happening just now, and just very recently, is that we can start asking questions to the big pack platform companies, like, you know, like we did with Facebook, just, okay, you know, we're no longer going to give you our content, we're no longer going to have you uh, put ads next to this type of content. So I think it's the responsibility, once again, of, you know, big corporate or other corporations dealing with Facebook, with Google, and et cetera, the responsibility of users and, of course, the responsibility of governments. It's not just, you know, governments so far have been mostly interested in privacy law, in uh, intellectual property, dealing with, you know, the, uh, uh, the values that I had on the left side, security, co you know, confidentiality, that, those, are, those are very important. But I think what they have really underestimated is the, value, the, the importance, the significance of public values on the right side. Like, what does it do to us on the law, in the long term? How does it treat us fairly? How does that system affect what we do on an everyday basis? And how does it uh, affect, for instance, uh, inequality? How does it affect, you know, that intransparent uh, collect, uh, um, uh, collection of mechanisms in between is so much influencing what we do every day. And people are hardly asking, what happens in between? What is it that these mechanisms do? So it may not have been um, very systematic in this talk, but in the book, we're really, really focusing on what those mechanisms do. And perhaps, and that's, I want to mention him once again, Tarleton Gillespie, who is uh, uh, looking very much into, for instance, moderation mechanisms. He goes very deeply into what does uh, what do algorithms do in terms of, modera of moderation, moderating content for us? Um, algorithms are basically business secrets, and we, I think we need to urge the big five players to help us make things more transparent. If they won't, in the long run, their business will be doomed, because, of course, as you know, assertive consumers, we also have power. As you know, we're both users and consumers at the same time, so we produce the data while we're also consuming. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, might be the trick, might be the opening towards a, a different attitude by users than, for, than you, the consumers had in the past. Right. Perhaps this is a very long answer to your very short But it was an interesting question. answer, so it was <laughs> worth it. <laughs> uh, I will, however, now open the floor for questions from you folks. Uh, I hope that you have some, and uh, um, I'll make this demonstration once more, because not all of you were here last session. This is a catch box. This means this is a box that you catch when I throw it at you. And inside it is a microphone, so you hold it up under your chin, and you speak into it. Um, and also, I might want to mention that if you want to write on social media about this symposium, we hope you hashtag it LU350 so we can find it easily. And we do have a question right over there. I think I'll step over here to maximize my chances to actually... Yeah, that was pretty good. Go good ahead, catch. sir. And please, uh, won't you tell us who you are and where yes, you... Yes, you know. of course. Uh, hi, Joachim Pixer, uh, Rice6. I'm a privacy researcher. Um, so... There is a sort of strange dichotomy in the responsibility of platforms that you're talking about. On the one hand, we have the, the problem that has been talked about for many years, that um, platforms have a, an increasing importance in our lives, and they, they affect us in, in very different ways, and we are skeptical about that power. But on the other hand, there has been a move in the recent years to make sure that the platforms actually do self-regulate and make sure that they right. take 
decisions that are affecting our democratic society, such as uh, Google's right to be forgotten, um, such as the uh, censorship, or not, sorry, not censorship, but the filtering of hate speech uh, and advertisement. Like, how do you square that dichotomy between, on the one hand, being skeptical of the platforms regulating, and then on the other hand, the general push towards actually wanting the platforms to regulate even though they are not government agencies and they affect us in, in big ways? Right. Well, that's a complicated question. Um, actually, I have put up some questions and those were some of my most important questions that I still need to answer. So I don't promise I can give you an answer in just you know, a, few, a few sentences. That, in fact, is the most complex issue. There's one thing I forgot to mention, there's, and that even makes your question more significant and uh, even adds to you know, the problem, which is that uh, all kind of regulation is usually, you know, self-regulation is one thing. Self-regulation is what the companies want. You know, if you, can, if you want to please them, you just use the word, the word self-regulation, and they, they say they will do it. Now, as for regulation, we have an additional problem. That's, of course, that regulation is taken care of on, the national, on a national basis. Local sometimes, I was talking about city councils, for instance, national and supranational. I have m the most confidence of all those levels. I have the most confidence in, for instance, European courts and supranational uh, regulation because it can do more and it's, it's more frightening in a sense to these companies than you know, the local and the national levels. So we have to start collaborating on the European level to talk about what is our bargaining power, what are, our, are the bargaining chips that we want to put on the table if we talk to platforms like Uber or Airbnb. They love the fact that they have to go you know, to all these different cities like Amsterdam and New Orleans and, uh, and Barcelona, you name it, to negotiate with local governments because they can get a better deal out of each of those local governments. But in terms of the issues that we're really interested in and are really important, they're at the level where you know, local governments can't really bargain. They can't you know, put the chips on the table that is needed to bargain those uh, significant issues. So I think we need to work on all levels, local, national and supranational. And we, need, we shouldn't take for granted that the companies themselves are uh, saying, well, just let us self-regulate you know, whatever we do, because in the end, you know, we will all benefit from it. You know, I don't think so. I don't think that public values is a self-evident, you know, sort of human rights thing. No, human rights and public values need to be negotiated at every level in every different nation. We all have different values that we value more than others. Here, Sweden here is different from the United States, different from Britain. And I think we have not only the right, but also uh, the obligation to as citizens, you know, to participate in that negotiation battle, in that contest. Now, I sort of went off, and, 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 and I think I forgot at least one important part of your question. Yeah, so one other part of the question is, um, like, when it comes to the right to be forgotten, uh, right. Google has to make a judgment on what is relevant speech, what should be visible or not. So do we right. want companies to do those decisions? Um, you know, it's interesting, and now I come back to the, the pizza paradox, is that they're saying, well, you know, we're not moderating because we are not a, you, call, you name it, news company, a taxi company, or whatever. So we don't need to do that because we're not part of that system that you're trying to force us into. They love being in that gray legal area and gray social area that we now call the platform society, as if there were no... Um, direct connection with uh, all the offline sectors that they're actually uh, that they're part of and that they're making their money off. You know, the biggest part of that paradox is that they're actually using uh, taxis and real estate and you know all these things in the offline society in order to make their bucks, right? So if we if we constantly allow them to self-regulate, uh, uh, to define everything on their own terms, what the platform society should be, and keep their processes 
uh, hidden from the public view, I think we're in deep trouble because we cannot trust the negotiation about public values to one part, one third part of that circle, which is the market forces. I think in every type of negotiation, we need to take into account civil, you know, civil actors and uh, market as well as state actors. I think it's in the middle, and perhaps I'm a little bit of a Habermasian here, like the ideal public sphere, which is still like, you know, it's perfect, that balance between market, state and civil society. I wish it were that way. It's not, you know, it has never been that way. Let, you know, I'm not uh, ahistorical here, so this, it's, it's not, it's never been perfect. It will not be perfect. The only thing I'm arguing here is we need to stand in the middle to be part of that negotiation. And what I'm seeing now, and now I'm getting back to regulation, is that states sort of imitate what uh, companies are, keep telling, let us self-regulate this business. We're very good at this. Everything will be fine in the end. Well, I don't think it will be fine in the end. I think those will be the values that are inscribed in the crust, that are baked into the crust. And you think crust. the states are backing down? That they I are think the that. states are not doing enough to regulate, or at least to pay, play their part in this equation game, right? Mm. I think uh, all of us and all of the, the civil actors and the state actors should do more to remain uh, um, uh, trustworthy participants in that negotiation game. Hmm. More I'm questions? becoming an activist here on stage. Yeah, I think you are. <laughs> um, there's one right behind there, and sure. then we have one up here and one there. We'll try to make time for all of these, so please keep it, try to keep it brief. I'm going to be very short. Um, big fan of the pizza metaphor. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I just want to add just a little bit, because I think, uh, like, tying in with what Stefan was saying, what you were saying now, um, with the, I mean, one of the issues is that with privacy, as privacy uh, breaches continue by these companies, um, people have started to like take things into their own hands by using, so like ad blockers or uh, right. plugins like Disconnect. So, and I'm not sure if you've heard about this, but now Google is planning to integrate an ad blocker into Chrome. So now we're seeing since like the states are failing to intervene, these companies are taking their own hands, and I'm sure, like with Google, you can, there's obvious conflicts of interest. And I think, like, we're just steering, going deeper into this sort of like uh, government, corporate governance sort of like right. sinkhole. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I've seen the ad campaign too. It's huge. They have a big ad campaign in the newspapers this week. And the thing that you know, it's one step forward. It's not that, you know, I think it's way overdue for one thing. So that they should have done that a long time ago, but okay, they're doing it now. And it really, it puts all of the emphasis on privacy, which I think is good. But what I'm arguing is indeed one step further, which is publicness. I think publicness is not just, you know, one step further than privacy. It needs to be discussed along with privacy. What parts of our lives are, you know, do we have the right to keep private? And that finally, you know, also due to the uh, GDPR uh, uh, law next year being implemented in Germany, I think we're one step further. But now we need to look at the long-term effects, and that's not just privacy, that is publicness. What do we want with our public sphere? What do we want with... You know, oh, we discussed over dinner last night the uh, public media companies in all of Europe. You know, you may not find this a big thing if you're American because public media doesn't mean anything, but in my country, and I assume here in Sweden, uh, public television is a big thing. Now, there's a huge, uh, you know, sort of fight going on between the content producers working for employees of uh, the uh, public media, uh, uh, public broadcasting in Holland, and the, um, uh, what is it, the people in charge of the, uh, uh, the board of the uh, public broadcast system, where they're saying, well, you can't just go onto YouTube and everything that's been produced, you know, in a public context, in a public value system, you cannot just go to a, a commercial distribution system and just throw it in there where, uh, you know, they make money on what we have produced because you're taking it out of context and the editorial decisions that we make within our public context are so much different from the commercial ones. We don't want to get involved in uh, what, you know, some of the advertisers have uh, reasons to withdraw from, fake book, from Facebook right now. Fake book, that would be another <laughs> nice name. I didn't do that on purpose, sorry. It was just, it just However, slipped. we will now hashtag everything it was a with that instead. slip of the tongue, of course. It's, it's Facebook, sorry. Um, but you see what I mean? So, um, so there's this huge contest constantly, constantly between what is it that we need to do in the public sphere to 
to remain public. And yeah. that question, what, is it, what does it mean, publicness? What does it mean to have a public sphere or to have a uh, public organization? You know, we as teachers, at least for my part, uh, when I teach at the university, each time, uh, you know, people ask me, do you want to collaborate with me on this course, on Coursera or on edX? Or, and I think, okay, do I really want to do that? Do I want a you know, commercial company make money out of my uh, teaching value? Or, mm. uh, and I put that on, you know, whatever. I don't control it. You know, I lose control over whatever I put out in, uh, these plat on these platforms. And that is something that is very dear to me, the public sphere and you know, defining and controlling sort of the context that I used for value creation. Sorry right. about in That's okay, but speech. I promised two more people to ask a question. <laughs> sure. <obviously. laughs> Will you pass the catch box over here, please? Oh, she can't catch anything, but she'll grab it instead. That's just fine. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Jutta Heide. I'm a researcher in information studies in Lund. I love to pizza. Can you speak in the microphone? Yes, you I, I uh, love just move it further. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Jutta Heide. I'm a researcher here in, uh, in information studies here in Lund. I uh, I adore the pizza metaphor, and I will be using <laughs> fake book all the time. Okay, now. Thank, thank you for your But I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on the issue of the pluralities of uh, of platform societies. Yeah. How are they differentiated? Is it just the big five are each their own society, or do you mean the China versus the West kind of societies? Could you expand a bit more on that? That would be. Okay, Very that good that is a hard thing to make brief, but I know it's because it's going to be my next book. But I, I, I thank you for asking <laughs> that question. Um, you know, this is really it. That's what I come to realize. I, I'm, I don't want to talk about the platform society, which is a mistake. It's you know a concept that we shouldn't use. This is what Mark Zuckerberg calls his community. You know, he calls about 1.9 billion people in the world his community. That's the community that's connected by Facebook. Now. Sorry, 1. billion people cannot be one community. And we should actually welcome the fact that there are so many societies and that there's diversity in the kind of systems that we have and that we allow in this world, because it's from diversity that you know, so many good things come, not just in you know, innovation and uh, uh, per, what Per talked about, but in government. So um, talking about platform societies, what I mean is, you know, this is the geopolitics of platforms, more or less, which will be the next book. But um, what you know, it's interesting that China does not allow the American ecosystem, platform system, to penetrate their system. You know, we may argue about that, but it's their right to have you know a certain uh, system as their own crust. What I'm arguing for, and this is what I would really like to know from you guys, and please mail me if you think you know this is an interesting ideas idea. What is it about Europe that we're so interested in having our diverse, different governments that are articulate, our values are articulated commonly very different from American values, but what do we want that society to be? What, you know, we have like uh, several dozen countries in this, uh, in this beautiful continent, but how different want, do we want our, those countries to be? Do we want our own ecosystem? I think this is one of the questions that never occurred to any government. Would we have liked to have our own crust baked? You know, would, do we like to have our own pizza crust? Perhaps. It's probably too late to, you know, bring that up right now, but it's still an interesting question to consider because we may still be interested in trying to reshape or co-shape that crust that has been, um, in, well, imposed, that has been become the normal food right now, right? So I think we should always think about societies in the plural because I refuse to think that the world is just, it would be a perfect idea, but, you know, an ideal, but this is not how it works. It's usually, um, usually if you use that phrase, like we are a community of 1.9 billion people, it usually is a statement that, um, uh, that, that feels, that hides where the power is. And if anything, I want to make visible where the power is, what it does, what it does to shape our society. So, you know, I don't want it to be used the platform society as like, you know, the one community that Mark Zuckerberg uses. It's like a variety of government forms that are reigning the world. Uh, you told you said you couldn't catch, but can you throw? Because I know that somebody <laughs> way back wanted. Wait, no. Yeah, there you go. So throw it as far as you can, and somebody will hold up both your arms so we can see where we're throwing. Oh, oh, not bad. And continue. Thank you very much. 
probably it is part of the platform. Okay, I'm Zaki Habibi, uh, research in media studies and visual culture. I'm based here in Dune University. So the discussion and elaboration that deals with platform usually re-raise the duality of perspective that is between technological determinism and cultural determinism. Mm. Well, it's kind of like a cliche, but when you mention in the so-called platform societies, plural, how do you see the relevance of this uh, coming back of this duality of perspective? And considering the complexity of platform development and their trajectories, as you have compellingly explained before, what is your position in such debate and probably to mm -hmm. relate to one of other of your main expertise, how do you also relate it with the notion of mediated memories <laughs> in the current <laughs> platform societies? Thank you. Gosh, you're asking me like, I, <laughs> next week I'm going to Stockholm and I gave two lectures on this topic. So I've, <laughs> I was already preparing them. Um, I will come to you, talk to you on the mediated memories part, right? But I will um, respond to you on the, your, the first part of your question, which is about technological determinism and how that plays into cultural determinism, which I think is an interesting point. Um, we were talking last night, and I've been responding several times to the question of technology in terms of, okay, what if we would just uh, invent a technology that would allow us to, you know, all have that same neutral infrastructure that we could all work from. Well, Tim Berners-Lee invented that infrastructure uh, some 20, uh, what is it, 27 years ago, which was called the internet, right? Now, on top of that infrastructure, we built this whole platform society, which is no longer, you know, a far cry from what he had intended to invent when he invented the internet. Um, uh, recently, I came, and this is sort of a history repeats itself story, um, some of my colleagues in the um, uh, computer science department came to see me and said, well, we have the big solution to your responsibility problem, which is blockchain. That's, you know, the next generation of technology that will help you to get rid of all your responsibility problems because, you know, blockchain is the technology that will make it possible for everyone. I was complaining about how opaque and, and, and impenetrable those systems were. And this will be the solution to your problems because it will make every single activity within that system visible to the outside. So. Then I started asking questions, of course, you know, blockchain has been around now for, what is it, a year and a half or so. And it occurred to me that they had never asked questions like, okay, who owns that technology? Who is in charge of um, sort of uh, distributing blockchain and who is in charge of keeping control of that technology? There were all these questions that I asked that I thought they thought were at least in part, or in the beginning, irrelevant to my uh, to their development of the technology, because once again, and that's sort of you know the beginning of technological determinism is, let's do the technology part first, and then you know we will ask questions about impact, consequences, implications, you know, all the rest. All that stuff comes after you have developed the technology. Whereas, to me at least, it is so important to ask those questions before you start designing the, uh, the question of techn or the, the technology itself. And those questions need to be baked into, once again, into that pizza crust, but at least in the technology that you're using. Because if not, it's not just an afterthought, you know, to... Uh, sort of invent val or to say that all those values they will they will figure into that equation no it's not an afterthought it's something that needs to be considered right before you start so i don't think there's um either it's either cultural or technological determinism i think we should get away from all these and that's why i pointed out that the platform society or societies is that that round in the middle the square that you know we would like to call a circle that is the negotiating part and that should start at the very beginning of the invention of technology or the re the shaping of that does that at least answer the first part of your question <laughs> Slightly, at least gives a hint. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask you a final question. If you try to look 10 years into the future, which is a long time when it comes to internet, um, do you see uh, an increased uh, strength of a platform society, mm -hmm. one, or will we see an increased amount of societies? Will we do all the different types of crusts? Will we have the whole grain and the gluten-free and 
all the different types, will we go in a more national direction? Is that mm -hmm. even possible, or will it all we sort of convene? Sure. Oh, I'm I'm terrible at prediction. Uh, but I think if I may refer to Lawrence Let's Professor Lessig's uh, talk this morning, uh, he made an interesting observation, or he just did that in the discussion afterwards about Russia being, you know, the decentralized sort of. You have to read eight newspapers in order to uh, to get to the truth. Um, I think we're in the, in this terms of the platform society, we're currently in the process of negotiation, negotiation um, finding what trust is. And redefining that is no easy matter. It's like redefining democracy, because I think, when I think of, you know, the, the talk about democracy this morning was at least as daunting and, and as, you know, uh, deeply troubling about the questions that you're asking about the platform society is asking questions about democracy. Where do we go from here? With all this technology at hand, does it allow us to turn it into a better technology? Can we use those instruments to reshape democracy for the better? I hope so. I'm an eternal optimist. Uh, so if you ask me what happens in 10 years, I always say, well, you know, we've managed to come this far. We might as well get 10 years ahead and turn it into a better democracy. But I have my doubts. As of, you know, the, for the past two years, I've become very critical of what the internet has allowed us to do. I was very optimistic at first, and now I think, wow, all the instruments that we've received have also, there's also so much we have lost, especially editorial responsibility. One of the things that, um, you know, I'm very, very, have a lot of passion about, so I'm very passionate about organizations um, giving themselves editorial responsibility and being open about that, right? So for me, that is sort of the, the crux, the, the heart of democracy. Mm -hmm. So mm, I'm very double-hearted, I think. You know, for one thing, well, I don't like pizza very much myself. So <laughs> hopefully we will oh, no. find a better metaphor. If anything, we'll find a better metaphor for discussing democracy and platform societies. I'm afraid this one has stuck. <laughs> but... <laughs> Jose, we're very, very happy that we, you've been here today. Well, thank you very much for being such a nice audience. And we have a present for you. Thank you so much. Thank you.